Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the day after the night before. Morning, Kay. Morning, Stel. Hello. Good morning. How are we all doing? Surviving? Barely. No, we're good. How are you? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. Uh, no uh, no uh, disaster to report after the FOMC, thankfully. Um, yeah, it was, uh, had, it was relatively... Uh, uh, how should I say it? Quiet, but yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about yeah. that. Um, just as we're starting, there's some uh, comments popping up from the Kremlin about this drone stuff yesterday, uh, saying that it requires thorough and urgent investigation. Um, Russia has multiple response options. Um, let's see if there's anything choosing that. Uh, Attempts by Kiev and Washington to disown the drone incident are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Right. Nothing hugely out of that lot. Um, they say air defences will be strengthened. A um, bit late for that, it seems. But anyway. OK, right. Just uh, in case there's any risk headlines in that, just having a quick flick through those headlines. Um, so let's get on to what's happened and is going to happen. Um, start as we often do in China and during this uh, holiday period that they've got over there um, the retail and catering companies um, see Labor Day holiday sales up 18.9 percent year on year according to the Ministry of Commerce um, <clears throat> so they are been on holidays there's also been a vastly big uptick in travel um, around the holidays, up some 70 to 80 percent um, compared to a year ago, which is pretty obvious considering they were having lockdowns and stuff like that. So it's no surprise to see this jump. A lot of people are looking for uh, the, this consumer rebound to happen as part of the reopening, um, much as we saw in a lot of other economies uh, when they reopened after COVID. Um, but the, the question will be whether it's short-lived or not, whether it's just a quick uh, bounce and then falls off a cliff again um, or whether it's sustained I suspect it's the former uh, but we shall keep an eye on that anyway. Um, China also had its PMI manufacturer or one of the PMIs uh, out um, overnight as well and that's dropped in back into contraction at 49.5 versus 50.3 um, on there. Um, just looking at, uh, we'll go over some of the other data while I've got the calendar up uh, as well. Um, yesterday's data and, well, data on the whole was pretty good. We've got the ADP uh, first off, which was a booming 296K versus a 148K expected. Uh, within that, the services side of things have done a lot of the heavy lifting once again. Uh, the component for leisure and hospitality gained 154 uh, thousand, so just over half of that 296 was down to leisure and hospitality. Um, that was one of the big gainers last month as well, 98k. Um, so you can see there, a huge chunk of the prior 142 or revised 142 number there. So a lot of input into that leisure and hospitality area, uh, which forms part of services. Um, and thus, no surprise uh, that the services numbers remain positive, although it did miss expectations. It was still up on last month in the ISM. In the components, um, employment was a touch weaker, um, which perhaps goes against uh, what happened in the ADP and what that was showing, uh, but still a positive number. Um, new orders. Fairly solid, not as much as expected, but up on the month previously. Um, and at all important, prices number, um, the inflationary pressures from that. A bit softer than expected, but still up on last month. And there's still plenty in the pipe uh, in terms of uh, cost pressures there. Um, back to the ADP. And uh, one of the lines from the people there said that employers are hiring aggressively while holding pay gains in check as workers come off the sidelines. Um, so that, again, signalling that um, there is a strong labour market still. Um, and that, uh, sorry, that's my phone going off. Um, but that perhaps wages are going to be more of a consideration for people, um, firms in particular, um, 
they're going to look at potentially keeping costs lower by not offering the bigger wages. That'll be good for the Fed um, because it takes out some of that uh, wage inflation that they've been talking about. Um, coming back to some of the other headlines, um, Norges Bank um, hiked their rate 25 pips as expected and said the rate will most likely be raised further in June. Uh, anything of note uh, from those guys, Kay? No, no, but they did uh, say that um, the Norwegian Kroner is a bit weaker than what their models would uh, suggest. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as we know, uh, a few days ago, they uh, they uh, um, told us that they were going to sell pretty much the same amount, uh, uh, 100 million Norwegian Kroner per day difference, but uh, sell the same amount of Norwegian Kroner every day. So um, uh, there's not too much to get out of that right here and now um uh, just to mention but uh, and and keeping although it wasn't a, a a meeting where they would decide upon the uh the rate path they do they do tell us that they are likely going to hike again in june so um norwegian product got its uh traditional half a percent slap uh, after uh, anything coming out of norway um, but then uh, this is stabilizing uh, roughly, uh, but still at lofty levels versus uh, uh, the euro. Nook is still very high. Dollar Norway is at interesting levels, though. Um, and, and we'll see what happens after the uh, after the ECB and after uh, probably tomorrow's NF NFPs. But uh, we are at interesting levels there and turning around. Um, but for the rest, no, nothing really uh, to take away from the Norges Bank, at least no uh, uh, no bombshells. Yeah, they did mention that um, uh, if the corona remains weak, then that's obviously going to have to perhaps change their... Um the rate path. I can't remember the words that they said, but basically they're acknowledging that a weak kroner is inflationary. Uh, yeah. Then they should actually stop selling the crap out of it. But anyway, that's a different story. Well, so, I mean, it's it perhaps a very early one, but it may be, I was thinking the same. It may be a hint at uh, what's going to happen next month, but uh, they, they usually don't take um, um, decisions on that during the month, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I read that that one as well. Yeah, yeah, I believe that as well. Um, all done on the orgies then. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, yep. <laughs> cool beans. Um, right. So, um, just looking at uh, before we get stuck into the Fed stuff, um, just going to look at some of the other headlines. Um, not too much floating around. Um, the U.S. Senate Majority Leader Schumer said that uh, the Dems hope to introduce a bipartisan bill to compete with China in the next several months. Um, so we should be on watch for that popping up and what bum fights that's going to create uh, between China. Um, one would hope it might be something that's conciliatory um, towards them, but very much doubt it uh, based on how the rhetoric is so far. Um, so we need to keep an eye on that later. Um, and again, going back to this Russia stuff. So we got this this apparent drone attack yesterday, um, which was reported by Russia, uh, saying that they tried to assassinate uh, Putin with a couple of drones. Um, and they say they reserve the right to respond when and how it sees fit. Um, Russia's Medvedev said the drone attack leaves Russia with no options except the elimination of Zelensky and his clique. Um, so pretty strong headlines there, but the market didn't really react to that um, yesterday. Um, it's almost as if Russia's creating excuses to do something. Um, false now, flag? Was, false flag, really? Well, <laughs> yeah. I say that, but it did have a scratch in our heads, you know, thinking about the reasons behind it. And then uh, uh, I was reminded by an article that uh, Sky News dropped that they've got their May Day celebrations coming up May the 9th, uh, which is a big deal in Russia. Um, and what they've been doing is trying to tone down what's going to happen at those May Day celebrations. Usually there's big marches, people out on the streets. It's a whole big hoo-ha. Um, and they've wanted to try and restrict and uh, contain some of those marches because they are worried that they will turn into anti war protests that will be seen around the rest of Russia and indeed the world. 
So it falls into play that this is potentially some sort of uh, fun and games to try and put or reinforce why they're restricting um, those 9th May celebrations. Um, what better way to do it than say you, you're possibly being attacked by zone uh, by drones and stuff. Um, and, you know, that also saying it's trying to assassinate uh, your leader, drums up the propaganda machine. So I'm yep. not I'm not saying it's a direct link, but when you put two and two together, you have more chance of getting four over what they're doing with this Joe drone news regarding those uh, celebrations than this was an actual attack from the Ukraine. Because you've got to ask, how does the Ukraine fly? And we're not talking like those big, massive plane drones. We're talking about the, the, the four propeller jobs. How anyone can fly drones around the Kremlin um, without being spotted, without there being air defences um, like that, uh, I, I really don't know. But I don't want to get into uh, too much uh, of the political argument. Um, what do you guys think of it? Yeah, I, I agree with what you say. It sounds unlikely, right? But uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of it. We don't know the details, but uh, it's definitely giving an excuse to Russians to do stuff in uh, quote-unquote retaliation. Let's leave yeah. it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Drama um, queens, so yeah, and exactly. <laughs> yeah, can, can we talk about the Norgas Bank again? <laughs> no, really honestly well, they got, i mean they there's got, no they, damage there's no damage no injuries no nothing come on let's get yeah. uh, a bit serious here um yeah. there's 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 no way that the uh, that the drone could uh could get even uh, close to the kremlin in my opinion so uh, i'm gonna yeah. leave it at that so make of that what you will um as i say it's it can be for two reasons one for these may nine celebrations two um creating an excuse to step up something in Ukraine, um, which we hope that's not the case, uh, because obviously there's still the talk of uh, tactical nukes being on the table as far as they're concerned. Um, so let's hope it's not that road that they're going to take for that one. But anyway, that's the uh, that's the news on the streets as far as that's concerned. Um, Keeping to Russia and the NATO intelligence chief said there are heightened concerns that Russia may target undersea cables and other infrastructure um, around. Uh, it was reported that uh, that cable, uh, that oil pipe that got uh, damaged, uh, Russian surveillance ships were seen in the vicinity um, around the time it happened. Again, draw your own conclusions. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Uh, back to the data, um, and it's been services day in uh, Europe and the rest. Um, we'll have a look first off uh, on the export front for Germany. Uh, exports down a whopping 5.2%, imports down a whopping 6.4%. Um, so for trade balance terms, uh, a little bit of a, a margin difference there. But on an activity basis, that's uh, a decent drop there on both aspects um, so that's probably why another reason why German GDP came in on the negative, um, albeit down 0.1% at the first reading. Um, you can see why there because of a drop in activity. Um, as I said, services stuff is coming out as well. Um, altogether, not looking too bad. Um, Spain dipped a bit to 57.9 from the 59.9 expected and 59.4 prior. Um, Italy had a decent improvement, uh, further gains there, 57.6. Um, same again for France, an uptick. Same again for Germany, an uptick. Um, so again, we're seeing the services numbers coming out uh, above the manufacturing numbers. The pan eurozone number, a touch lower than expected, but still a gain. Um, over in the UK, um, also services coming in more positive um, 55.9, so three ticks up over last month. We also got some uh, mortgage and consumer credit data. Mortgages uh, stepping up a bit, being the expectations back into the 50s, uh, 50Ks. Um, the consumer credit was up at 1.6 billion, um, so a rise there, give or take, uh, of about 100 billion there over last month. Um, I looked into the details quickly for the credit card aspect, um, which it can be a sign of, um, you know, stress and stuff. It was largely unchanged at around 700 million. Um, the, the pickup 
um, was in things like car loans and direct personal loans, which may be a factor we need to monitor um, if that's something that gains there, people taking out personal loans, depending on what they're using it to pay for, obviously. But as far as the uh, plastic concerned, uh, no need to worry on that front. Perhaps we'll keep an eye on this one a bit closer, as I say, because it has been ticking up overall. Um, so we need to make sure we're not getting into any sort of silly numbers up at uh, three, four billion on the consumer credit. Um, so let's get into the Fed then. All fun and games yesterday. So they hiked by 25 pips as expected and they withdrew some language out of um, the statement, which was pretty key. Um, and I'll show you that quickly here because I did a quick uh, text comparison. Um, so over on the left here, there was a part that said the committee anticipate that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. Uh, in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive. That was from the March statement. That got pulled right out, um, and they basically switched over to what's happening in, in uh, financial conditions and, obviously, the data. Um, so the market was looking at pause. Whichever way you, you shape it, the market was looking at a pause. Um, the Fed, they haven't paused, um, but... They sort of have paused, if you know what I mean. It's a pause without saying it's a pause. Let's put it that way. Um, so Fed's power said that conditions in the banking sector have broadly improved. Uh, the banking system is sound and resilient. Um, and then uh, talk about timing. Um, not long after that, Pacific West Bank went, uh, or was apparently going pop, uh, which is part of the reason why we're seeing a bit of risk off today as well. Um, so that couldn't come at a better time. Um they also said that they're going to take a data dependent approach going forward, uh, which are doing already. Activity in the housing sector remains weak. Uh, Labour market remains very tight. They are seeing the effects of policy tightening, particularly in housing and investment. Uh, but on the rate hike front, they are prepared to do more if warranted. Um, it's hard to predict how much credit tightening will replace the need for any further hikes. Uh, and the decision on a pause decision on a pause was not made today. Um, they're possibly at a sufficiently restricted level uh, or may not be far off. Um, it will be an ongoing process to assess the appropriate level of rates. Uh, the FOMC's inflation outlook does not support rate cuts. And a number of policymakers at today's meeting spoke about pausing, but said that it's not for this meeting. Uh, now, straight after that, uh, Fed funds futures uh, implied a 22% of a rate cut in June and 72% for July. Uh, so rate cut in June. Um, rate probabilities uh, this morning are showing the next meeting as unchanged versus a 25 pip cut for June. Um, that's 98% probability for unchanged and 2% towards a cut. So the market is already stepping up the old Fed's on pause when they're going to cut next. That's the trade we're going to be playing moving forward. Um, now, Powell pretty much played word bingo, ticking off all the, uh, all, the, all the words we were expecting, financial conditions, data dependency, blah, 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 blah. Um, and he was at pains to walk both sides of the line. You know, if he, if he said something that could be in, interpreted hawkish, he counted it with something that wasn't and vice versa with the dove side. Um, so effectively, the Fed are probably on pause. I still think they've maybe got one, possibly two more hikes in them um, if inflation remains sticky and, and doesn't uh, fall drastically till the next FOMC. Um, and also, we obviously need to see what all the rest of the data does, including the NFP that we get tomorrow. Um, as far as the reaction was concerned, um, I was watching the price action coming into it and uh, we were talking in the room, talking on face yesterday that it didn't matter what happened. The dollar was under the fire, under fire. Um, we got that ADP number. It pinged up to near 136, um, lasted about 30 seconds and then popped out again. That was that uh, move in there. Then we got the ISM, similar situation, another pop, another drop, um, each time making fresh lows. So the market was in rally sell mode. Um, and as mentioned, I, 
I really didn't see anything that the Fed would pull out that would get a sustained move in the dollar. Um, nothing hawkish or more hawkish than they are already. And that's how the market's seen it too. So what are your thoughts, guys, um, on the Fed? Can kicked or um, are we at the end of the hike cycle? Good question. Um, we did talk about this yesterday, right? And I said, I think they're going to give us uh, both sides of the argument. 25 was pretty much done and that's what they delivered. And uh, lo and behold, they also kind of tried to cover all bases and both sides, like you correctly said. So what do I think is happening going forward? Um, I think we're done with the hikes unless inflation starts ticking up. Uh, there is a chance of that, but I think inflation is going to keep ticking down. Maybe not a, at a great pace, but I think it will continue. Um, the issue I have with the market is with, with the pricing of the of the rate cuts, and I think that is, given what we know right now, I think that's probably not realistic. I mean, cutting by what was it, July, or something like that. I mean, that's um, it's way too soon, and we have to admit that. Uh, uh, I was going to say Bernanke. Powell um, has told us repeatedly that, look, you know, we're not going to be cutting or, or you know, may, maybe not in those words, but uh, they're going to be staying higher for longer. And I think that's what's going to happen unless we see uh, some banking collapse and really escalation of the, the whole situation. And by the way, um, I don't know how Powell can say that the whole thing with the banking system is uh, stronger now and, and more robust. I mean, where is he seeing that? I have no clue. But um, uh, for now, knowing what we know right now, I think cuts are absolutely out of the question, at least not this close uh, to where we are now. So um, uh, I think higher for longer is going to be the way. And um, uh, but as you as you said correctly, Ryan, he has he has covered all the bases, and he's, uh, uh, we are data dependent. Uh, but you know, there's a risk to the economic outlook, and uh, you know, inflation is high. But this and that is always the same uh, two way speak from Fed so and from other central banks. So uh, you know, market wise, what do I think? I still think the dollar is a sell on rallies. And um, I think that uh, risk is buy on dips. It doesn't make too much sense for risk specifically, but I think that's um, that's still the, the the path of least resistance. But yeah, yeah, it's difficult to make any more conclusions from yesterday because it was uh, quite vague overall. So I don't know what Kay thinks. That's that's my uh, two cents. Yeah, Kay, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, exactly as expected, right? Uh, 25 and uh, going data dependent, like they already hinted at the last time. Um, as I said, also, they are they are now around their possible plots, um, a possible target rate around 510. And uh, that's it. Now he has to go um, neutral. And that's it. That, that is it. I was exactly saying that, that on, the, on the chat yesterday as well. It's that... Um, he really made sure to uh, to whenever he was saying something hawkish to follow it up with something uh, something dovish. And um, I'm looking at the euro dollar. We're exactly two pips away from where euro dollar was before the FOMC. Um, we are a little bit higher in the cable. We are exactly at the same level in the Aussie dollar, for instance, or, or dollar Canada. Um, and that's what a neutral FOMC uh, is uh, is probably giving us now. It's over to the ECB. The yen, I think, is much more to do with um, with risk. Um, that uh, and and I've been saying that also on on the different shows and in and in the chat room. Um, that is my expectation. The new governor, we we are going to be in some sort of normalization. But what did not work for a year and a half or more than a year and a half, nearly two years on uh, on the correlation be, uh, between yen and risk is probably going to kick back in into play um, with, with a vengeance perhaps. And um, we've seen that yen is really starting to react again to risk. And that is, in my opinion, a normal uh, development um, because there, there's always going to be some sort of correlation. Uh, we, we had only one currency um, really uh, pink to risk in 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 Europe, which was the Swiss, and perhaps a bit of a uh, Aussie also in uh, on on the um, Asian front or of uh, of the world. But I think yen is going to be now uh, uh, 
a risk currency again. Um, yeah, for the rest, um, I I agree with Stel. I, I don't think uh, they are ready to cut rates unless the fatal domino starts to fall, and that is employment. And uh, I think that is now, in my view, even more opinion, more more important. Sorry than uh, than than CPI. Of course, if CPI collapses, whatever, then then then. That, that that's a reason to stop as well. But the big one is going to be the real economic data, and uh, and and that is going to be the employment. Um, one interesting point that he mentioned, and that is telling me that they are really on pause now, is that the curve is in positive territory. And if we recall, uh, I think somewhere in twenty early twenty twenty two, even late twenty twenty one, he was already saying we want the whole curve to be. Uh, in the positive territory, and we were all scratching our head, um, uh, wondering what uh, what he's looking at um, in in the rates, because some of them were already massively positive. But uh, um, now he 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 accepted or he acknowledged that it was uh, in positive territory. So that to me tells us that we are in pause land. Yeah, and what he means by that, for for those who may not know, is that in 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 real terms, um, the rates of the interest rates higher than the rate of inflation. Um, but again, you can do a bit of uh, you can do a bit of manipulation depending on what inflation number you want to look at. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether it's PCE, whether it's core, whether it's headline, whether it's this or whether it's that. Um, I've I've probably seen about five different tweets of people claiming that rates are positive based on different inflation measures. Um, so anyway, it's m moot point um, in terms of that um, and what people think anyway. Um, but as far as the price reaction goes, I mean, you know, if you if you take out this move, which is considerable, um, take out the BOJ, take out the FOMC, take out the data we've had, you know, we are give or take back in this area before that happened. Um, and the fact that we couldn't break out of the bigger box, i.e. the top at 138, um, was pretty telling. Um, so for me and, and my short positioning, I'm I'm more comfortable now than I was. certainly was on Tuesday. Um, but it shows that we're not ready quite yet to go to anywhere new. Uh, the question now is, you know, have we gone as far as we want on this move down from that high? Um, you know, now we've had the Fed, now we've had everything going on, now we've got this banking mess carrying on. Um, I think rallies continue to be sold. Um, I think while the weight of the banking stuff and other geopolitical stuff weighs the debt ceiling, that sort of thing, still weighs around the neck of the, the US, it will weigh around the neck of the dollar. So I think even if we get a good NFP tomorrow, um, if none of those other situations have resolved or got better, um, that's going to be a rally that gets sold into. Um, the question is, is there more to happen? Um, yes, the market is now creeping towards the uh, extreme side of predicting rate cuts. Um, you know, we're looking really September, um, if you ignore those probabilities that are probably a bit wacky at the moment. Um, so, you know, cuts in September, are they going to happen? I think it's too soon to, to predict, um, but a lot can happen in a few months. So the question is going to be is how much will the pivoters want to push that trade? Um, and for that, we need to keep an eye on yields, um, which, you know, have suffered after the FOMC. You know, here we are. I'll have to adjust that number, but that's the new Fed midpoint, 5.125. And here we are, you know, 130 odd pips below. You know, that doesn't say the Fed are keeping rates up that long, even on the one year. Not much of a dip down, but still well below the Fed midpoint. So the higher for longer is still being disbelieved by a lot in the market. The question is how much further they might push that trade. So if yields, you know, come right down, particularly in the short end, you know, get this one year down at four and a half percent, maybe down to the four percent, that might be where we see extreme pricing for cuts. Um, and if that's the case, that may be where the next trade appears um, to look to fade that move if the Fed aren't going to cut as the market expects. So really what we might be playing or going to start playing in something like dollar yen is pretty much the opposite to a lesser degree than what happened over the last year or so. So all this big move here, you know, that was a huge move. 
based on both the Fed and the Bank of Japan, obviously standing still. Um, but we might be playing that sort of game on the opposite side coming down. Um, but it's not going to be as big as that, I shouldn't think. Remember, we're only talking about rate cuts down to a potential neutral level, which may be around the 2 to 3% mark. Uh, so there's only 200 pips of cuts, give or take, from where we are now. We're not going to be cutting to zero. We're not going to be going back to QE, um, unless obviously some sh more shit hits the fan somewhere. Um, so you've got to take it in context. If the pivoters are going to get an upper hand, we're going to see further selling in the dollar. Um, as Kay mentioned, you know, we're pretty much back where we started in some of the other pairs. We had another look at uh, 111 in euro dollar. Um, that happened this morning. Couldn't get above it. Maybe some hesitancy to, to push the boundaries ahead of the ECB. I don't know. But this is now our key level on the top side. If the dollar is going to get sold, we need to crack that. If we crack that, we're probably seeing 112 not long after. Um, as I mentioned previously on, on yesterday's show, if we get above there, um, you know, we're probably headed up uh, perhaps for a test of the bigger 115 level, which is a huge level, always has been. Um, and we'll find plenty of traffic in the 114s. I'm considering maybe dropping in a couple of buy stops um, in this one above 111. We have got barrier action up there. Um, so that's a reason why it's probably being defended so robustly at the moment. Um, so I'm thinking about a buy stop but it depends where it when it comes if it happens before the ecb then it's likely maybe just a quick uh, barrier attack if it happens over the ecb then it may be due to some comments or news that uh, is more hawkish and then it's going to be a bit more of a sustained break um but for now that's our level on the top side um for the euro um on the downside the trend remains our friend uh and dips into the low 109s is where the buyers are coming in. Um, so that's going to be a marker for today as well. So decent couple hundred pips uh, for you to park your buses in and have a little play around in. Um, well, I've been doing a bit of waffling. Kay, do you want to uh, pick out some choice pairs or give us a view on uh, the ECB and uh, the Euro? Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, <clears throat> let me grab uh, the screen Right, so into the ECB, um, euro dollar. Well, it's it's clear, right? As as Ryan already said, um, there's stuff going on uh, at one eleven. That's your gateway, right, to um, to what may happen before. And I'm I'm going even if it's daily. Um, there's a few trend lines and a few fibs around here. I think there's a lot that will be going on um, in somewhere in the 112s as well, before we can talk about what Ryan showed in uh, uh, around uh, 115. But uh, a pop through 111 is, is really not to be ruled out. It's really the, the side the market is looking at as well. And um, as I was saying in, in the room, um, and Ryan already spoke about that, those bits in those low uh, 109s. If you look at what how the ECB and how the Fed, if you only take those two, right, and, and not um, look at what other crap might be going on in the market. The ECB is in rhetoric uh, as well, catching up a little bit on what the Fed was doing. So I do think that the market is really looking to at least go for a test um, of, of or trying to break. I, I really wouldn't rule it out. Because there's this chance today, um, and we haven't spoken about the possibilities that the ECB may do, but there are still um, economists out there who think that the ECB may do 50 BPs today. So watch out if that would be what we get. And I'm not saying we will get it. Um, there, there are a legion of possibilities. Uh, well, a legion, at least two or three, four possibilities that's going to happen today. You can have a hawkish 25 VPs, you can have a dovish 50 VPs, or you can have, um, Lagarde says, uh, and, and in, on top of that, Lagarde may actually remain because she has been on the, on the more hawkish side lately compared to what she was like a year, a year and a half or so before uh, ago. She may decide to remain hawkish for now. And that, in my opinion, with how the market is now 
looking at the dollar and looking at the euro and, and if we look at those euro crosses it has been trading it already for a month a month and a half but in in the in the market's mind there is clearly the fact that the euro is having a a, a a benefit over the dollar right now. So if the ECB would come out hawkish today, I really think we are going to have a test of this, uh, a really thorough test of this 111. And it could look very spiky if we get through there, because um, when we say barriers, there's there's usually two, and I'm, I'm going to go on a shorter time frame to, to perhaps show you the a possibility of, of, of what may happen on a, uh, it's a bit too short. <coughs> and I'm not wide enough there. So, on, on, a, on a barrier, you, you have a couple of things that may go on. So for the time being, assume that it's defended because we couldn't get to, to 111. If the barrier gets taken out, there could be um, several possibilities. Either you just go above, you do the barrier, and then you crash away um, at least um, 40, 50, 60 points if it's a pure barrier hunt. But in today's market, there's a fair possibility that if the barrier gets taken out, since this is the move of the euro dollar, we are getting uh, impulses from model funds or, or uh, CTAs or whatever to buy more. And in which case, this could get really explosive. Okay, And uh, so these, these are two main possibilities that uh, that could happen. You do a little bit of stops. You do... You do um, because those who were defending it don't need to be short again, but those who were attacking it don't need to be long again. And then usually you do a bit of wishy-washy and, uh, and and you come off again. But for today, it may be uh, that, that it's getting really explosive. And then you are going to see, likely going to see those 70, 80 points could, could be done really quickly. But that will really depend on what, what the ECB is telling us, what Lagarde is telling us. We, we did get a little bit more of a balanced um, of, of balanced comments out of uh, the hawks and, and the doves um, lately, but we haven't really heard about what Lagarde really thinks, right? So um, it, it, there could be really a clincher today to 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 attack this um, this, this one eleven. So uh, be careful what's happening around one eleven because it could really um, spike if if it goes. Um, and then we have to look at the euro crosses, right? Um, we've, whoops, this is the cable, no. Um, we have to look at euro crosses. And as I was saying on prior meetings, I think the euro yen is, is the least obvious because you can, um, there has been this big setback in, in, in yen pairs. Um, but but we are on on interesting on interesting levels here in the euro yen, um, and it's in this mid one forty eight. It's very it's too close for comfort on on an ECB decision, which is is too important just to to look at the market uh, 15, 20 points from where we are. Um, but look at it as a as a, perhaps a point of measurement um, of what may happen after the fact if, if it goes below and then it starts to move higher again um this this level could have some uh, some importance because if it if we break a little bit below on a bit of risk off which we are seeing now because uh i'm, I'm just seeing that the the equity markets s p uh especially is uh is, is weakening again um it could be that we drop below on a bit of risk off, but then if the euro is strong enough, getting getting back above here. So I'm still thinking that this is perhaps a a bit of a mm, yeah, less obvious pair to trade if you really want to trade something like risk off, especially on the, on on the ECB. If the ECB goes all mellow and uh, and we continue to see that that risk off uh, in play, um, those yen crosses are going to probably tank a lot more. Um, one that is particularly uh, particularly vulnerable in in this play um, of of risk off, um, as we've seen already, is the Aussie dollar. If you look at um, at the Aussie <coughs> at the Aussie dollar as a pair, um, it hasn't enjoyed anything lately of what um, of of what the other dollar pairs may have done. Um, it's just hanging around in, in the 66 uh, and a half, 67 zone right now. Uh, it hasn't followed cable. It hasn't followed the euro dollar, hasn't followed any dollar yen move. 
Um, yeah, I know AJ, I'm showing uh, Aussie end, but I'm uh, just uh, um, showing it because I think it's one of the most vulnerable pairs if uh, Riskov continues to play out because of not only the end side, but also the Aussie side of, uh, of, of, the, um, of the equation. So um, we are turning around 89, 70, 75. There could be a little, there's a, there's a little bit of interest around here, but uh, mainly look at what's happening around 89, the figure in this pair and any move back up to uh, around, call it 90, 35, 50. That's going to be um, the, um, the point of measurement on the top side. If we start to go back up there, uh, up there again, it's either that your dollar yen is trading back above, uh, well above 135, or that Aussie dollar finally uh, found it enough, and that risk is not uh, that bad anymore um, in the US or so, um, and and then you can move higher again. But if if we stay on the risk of uh, boat, this one uh, is is particularly the vulnerable one, I reckon, because if you look at What's happening, for instance, on the Kiwi, and it's not at all the same, uh, not at all the same picture. And because it's uh, it, it, it's also one of the reasons is the Aussie Kiwi, but uh, the Kiwi itself has been behaving uh, has been behaving much better. So this one, much more undecided, I reckon. Uh, keep an eye on what's happening around uh, eighty three and a half, and then uh, around eighty four and a quarter on uh, on this one. But I told you that I was going to look at the uh, euro crosses, right? So uh, we have to look at uh, what's happening in the euro, euro Aussie. So we had a um, bit of a blowout um, last week towards the um, the end of the month. Then we had this setback. And I was thinking, you know, ECB could put in a top for uh, for the euro crosses. But then we we already did this move. Uh, early, much earlier than I thought, um, but now it's it's already back into the um, back on back on the way up. Um, if you look at it from a um, longer term view, we are uh, really holding very well around this this 164, 163, 80, 164 zone. Um, that that really is a, a reasonably important level here for the medium term, and as long as we are above. I, I don't see what's really um, going to take it much lower, unless unless we've got uh, we we get really positive uh, developments in uh, in risk, because um, euro Aussie especially um, is is one pair when when it's risk off the euro tends to strengthen uh, similar to the to to the yen the euro tends to strengthen versus uh, the uh, uh, the risk sensitive uh, uh, currency. So uh, unless risk is turning around, then we are going we're going to see levels back under and closes under um, 164. Got to be careful with uh, with shorts in this one. We could be heading back to uh, 168s and 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 why not even uh, 170 uh, over the medium the medium term. Um, another one. I'm not going to look too much at the euro sterling because it's really ping pong. Um, the one thing that we have to note, uh, and that's a combination of, of, of euro sterling and, uh, and, and uh, cable, um, is that the data in the UK are not really bad, are they? They, 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 they don't really fall out of bed. There was a lot of worry Worries about uh, the the UK situation coming into this year, and then um, and then um, um, yeah, the Bank of England messing stuff up. But then other central banks are all also messing their uh, their own uh, uh, game plan up. So this one, I'm I'm relatively neutral. I'm I can understand why we are rejecting um, um, moves higher. So. Uh, it's going to take a very strong euro, I think, to to uh, get it sustainably above this uh, 88, 65, 80 zone. So that is going to be a bit of a key zone for now, uh, 88, 65, 88, 80. Uh, if in turn you start to trade back below um, 87, 65, 75, uh, then we may get closer to back to those low 87. But as in a whole, as you can see, 
this is this is really a broad range. I think one is that is much more interesting is this one, cable. We keep banging our head uh, against this uh, this this channel uh, resistance, and that's right around uh, 12590. Uh, give and take 126. I'm I'm not sure whether there's any barriers involved there in the 126, but at least uh, if we get above there, I can see a relatively quick move uh, to go and test this trend line up in the around the 127. And I think in this 127, that's going to be an important zone for cable. Not only have we, will we have broken a um, yeah, and this 126 three quarter will play uh, will play a role. So you got like roughly a hundred pips or so zone in the cable, which is, in my opinion, going to be very, very, very important. If ever this starts to break above and hold, um, we could we could see a, a decent move up. But that's it's something that we need to take into account because next week we have the Bank of England, and the mood in the market is not pro dollar right now so it's going to take the dollar yields for one and and uh, the risk in, in in the us starts to 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 get lower um for for this to really uh cap and then perhaps trade more in the range um but if if the situation in in the us continues this this turning may be i'm still thinking that this may be a beneficiary and we're at least going to be in for a test of this one so um, that's a bit my uh, opinion. Just, just while we're on the, the pound, yeah. okay, yeah. just want to interject uh, for those that may not know, um, the UK are holding widespread oh, yeah. local mm. elections today. Um, so keep an eye on that early hours of tonight into tomorrow morning when we get all the results. Um, the, the ruling Conservative Party is expected to get a battering. Um, if that happens, it may have a, a bit of a negative effect on the pound. I'm not talking hundreds of pips because they're not parliament seats, they're just uh, councils and stuff. But it, it might swing sentiment a bit soft for the pound uh, in the morning if it's bad for the ruling party, which, of course, considering the trend, may be a gift for some. So just keep an eye on that one. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, I was just looking at the cloud in Sterling in, but that's my other way. Um, all right. Um, starting in, well, again, there we have been uh, rejecting the uh, the 172s. We are now trading already in the 169. Um, 168 and a half has been um, prior highs. So keep an eye on what's happening in 168 and a half in uh, in sterling yen. 40, 50. Yeah, give give and take. Uh, I'll go pips there, guys, because uh, these 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 crosses they they are. Uh, volatile, as we can see, um, they are very, quite quite volatile. Um, so 168 and a half is your first port of call, and under there uh, we're talking about 166 three quarters. Um, okay, uh, and and the big zone here is going to be 165 and a half, in my opinion. That's one thing. And then if you look at it um, on the other side, there's there's a long term uh, fib here in play uh, at 177. But as I said in the room, if we really get a confirmation above those levels, um, I think we're going to have to uh, take into account that this could go to 180. But therefore, therefore, I do think that the yen is going to have to help. Okay, uh, I mean this is not going to be a whole. Uh, sterling move, in my opinion, it, it, the yen will need to 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 help, and that means that likely, together with a cable move that that is going to remain supported, dollar yen will have to find support where Ryan was already uh, uh, um, hinting at as well, and then I think perhaps even before, you know. Um, Yeah, there's, there's there's a bit going on, uh, but but trend lines are being a bit massacred of late. But um, the one the first level here is 133.70, 133.90, 134. The figure where we started really from on on the BOJ, but then um, this one here is going to be a, a, a relatively important zone. Um, the the 133, the figure down to 132.80 stretch it to 
13260 figure uh, is, a, is a zone I'm really going to pay close attention to. Uh, but if, if it holds, we are going to need to get back, uh, first of all, above this prior high here, 135, uh, 1015. But then especially here, this, this is going to have to be retaken, right? And that's going to be needed, in my opinion, to then really take sterling in a lot higher, okay? And, and um, it's going to come, the love will have to come from uh, from both sides to, to take this really, really higher. Um, if the Tories get hammered today, it'll be positive for the sterling, surely. Uh, surely. Um, well, I... I really don't know. I think the market is expecting it so much that uh, I'm 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 a bit in doubt that it's going to have a lot of uh, of impact on uh, on the sterling. To be honest, but uh, yeah, Ryan may have, may have a different view on that. I'm, I'm... But guys, traditionally, the uh, any labor governments, socialist governments, are uh, not good for currencies. No, that's, that's exactly it. that's usually yeah. the case. Yeah, exactly that. But they are they are already expected to 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 lose some, so it's going to be probably more the balance than uh, than the fact of uh, gaining or losing, right? Um, see uh, the Dimitri is mentioning the euro cat. Have a look at this one. We are running. We are turning around there. One uh, one fifty and a quarter is the short term uh, the short term support, and then below we're talking about one uh, forty nine ninety five figure, and then this one here. Coming in around uh, 149.70. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, if you think that oil has seen the bottom, <clears throat> Eurocat may be one um, that starts to that starts to turn around. But is it going to be the Eurocat? That'll depend on the on the ECB, right? Um, Data in Europe don't warrant an ECB dovish stand, in my opinion. But are they strong enough to to keep the the ECB really hawkish? That I'll gladly leave in the middle for um, for this round. Uh, I'm really going into the ECB with an open uh, with an open mind. If they come out dovish though, then I'm going to try this one again. Uh, you're an okay. um, I, I think this. Um, I know there's still a chance of going into the 1203, but uh, this is the first day that the Norwegian Krona has not lost uh, ground and and um, kept the lost ground. It actually regained, um, it regained um, uh, even if it's even trading a little better, a little bit better than where we for uh, where we were before the Norges Bank. And that's perhaps a little bit of a change. But for the Euro hockey, it's too early for to judge. I do think, though, if we start to get back below 11.75, then we may have a quick run down to 11.50. But that's music for uh, after the ECB. I think this one is probably more interesting, especially if the ECB would uh, would be at least neutral towards the hawkish side, as since we know that the, the market likes to sell dollars these days, keep an eye on what's happening around 10.75 at the close of the day. If we are below, that may mean that we have seen the best of this dollar Noki and we could go back to levels probably closer to 1050. And with that, I'm giving it back to you, Ryan. I've taken enough uh, of people's time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just on to GW. Um, it's, it's mainly going to, this election thing, it's mainly going to be a case of um, yeah, if the Conservatives get battered, where do the votes go? It can be a bit of a protest vote. Um, there's not too much importance placed on it by the public because it's not for parliamentary seats. So it gives them a chance to give uh, whatever party a bloody nose. Um, but I think the market reaction will more be based as cases on where the votes go. If it's a straight out of Conservatives into Labour, that might be seen by markets as uh, a bit negative because a Labour government isn't generally seen as positive uh for the uk uh, economy um but if it goes all the votes don't go to labor and they all go to the independents and uh the lib democrats and smaller parties um then you can probably really brush it off as a as a protest vote um and that it may not be reflected should there be an election uh the next one anyway um but i'm not expecting to say a huge reaction from it but it's a risk and as traders we keep an eye on risks um, so wise, words, got, mate. Yeah. wise words thank you very much 
Uh, all we've got well, all we've got left is uh, the ECB. Um, my expectations going in is that they will probably do a 25. I, I, I think a 50 might be on the table, but I think it's low risk. I think uh, the Doves gave a concession on the last 50. Um, they've probably given a concession on the last few 50s. Um, so it may be the turn for the Hawks to give something back to the Doves and just go a 25. Um, I don't think they will be giving us any sort of pause projections. Um, and that's going to keep, should keep the Euro on the bid side through that and the ECB closing the gap between the Fed, uh, them and the Fed. Um, so, yeah, as far as Euro goes, you know, we've all spoken about the levels. We know the top side, we know the downside. Um, if you're going to be trading it, look for moves either side and whether any news that makes the euro move is justified and can be sustained uh, we know the trend for the euro at the moment so anything that dents that uh, may well be a good fade trade to look at uh, but we shall find out tomorrow uh, or we'll find out later today but we shall talk about it tomorrow on tomorrow's show uh still you got any last thoughts you want to put on the ecb or anything no i agree with what you said uh, 25 i think is probably done and uh you know, they're following with a lag, uh, the Fed, and uh, there's no reason for them to be overly hawkish, even though inflation is high. You know, they're going to leave the door open. You know, Lagarde is, is very good at that, at uh, being more dovish than expected. So I think 25 and kind of a balanced outlook, in mentioning inflation obviously being sticky, but also uh, acknowledging the, the global situation, you know, banking and Credit Suisse and everything that's happening in this lovely world of ours. So um, let's yeah. see what we get. Yeah. And I just want to highlight something. And I hope people are, are taking this distinction and, and learning from this. We've seen what happened with the Fed and its rate cycle and what happens when the market expects the Fed to get to its top and then cut. The ECB are lagging, Estelle says. They're still in their rate cycle. So, you know, extrapolate what's happening to the Fed over to the ECB that will potentially happen at some point. And you're going to see the same market moves. Markets only go up or down. Um, they just go up and down for different reasons at different times. Um, but they still all move the same ways over the same things, just at different speeds and time. So learn from the Fed, apply it to the ECB and other banks uh, further down the line. Have a great day, everybody. Good luck over the ECB. Don't fall asleep uh, too quickly when the guards start speaking. I'm usually done by about the third question. Um, have a great day and we'll see you all tomorrow for the review thank you very much and thanks to Stel and Kay thank you Ryan thanks Kay hey traders this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel don't forget to like these videos share them and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free thanks for stopping by I'll see you in the next video <laughs>